Have you ever felt frustrated by miscommunication or struggled to get your message across effectively? Well, don't worry, you're not alone. Communication barriers destroy collaboration. They destroy teamwork and productivity. Today, we're gonna explore the different types of barriers from noise to cultural differences, and we're gonna provide practical strategies to overcome them. So whether you're a team leader looking to enhance your communication skills or an executive striving to foster a more connected workplace. This episode is going to give you those tools you need to break down the barriers and elevate your communication game. Welcome to the Real Resilience Podcast with your host, yours truly, Matthew Lestalia. This is where we dive deep into your role in building robust and resilient workplace cultures. You're the star of your own movie. I'm simply vying for a role as the best supporting actor by offering lessons I've learned through my studies of organizational psychology, my 12 years of service in the army, and my role as a parent over the last 15 years. I put this all together to build a new approach to leadership, something that I now call connected leadership. It's a new style of leading that draws from what we already know that works, but has now been re-engineered for our modern world. In today's episode, we're tackling a topic that affects us all, barriers to communication. Let's kick this off by talking about noise, the noise barriers. Now, when we hear noise, we probably immediately think of, well, Noise, sounds, things that are happening around us. My kid closing the bathroom door or the trucks driving by outside. But in a workplace environment, this is going to show up as, you know, during a meeting, it can be sidebar conversations that are happening while someone's giving their opinion to the group or while someone's presenting, while you're doing a performance review or you're having a one-on-one conversation with one of your teammates and there's a bunch of noise happening around you or you're in a busy environment and there's a lot of hustle and bustle going on around you. If you're hearing voices and you're hearing a conversation app outside, that's going to be distracting both the sender and the receiver of information and you're not going to be fully engaged. It's actually so, Joe Rogan actually talks about this on his podcast. This is the reason why they wear headphones, you know, because it locks them in. Him and his guests, whoever he has on, they're locked in and they can hear their own voices as they're speaking and it makes you far less likely to interrupt another person which is particularly helpful when there's a lot of people like more than one guest that are on the show the same thing applies except we're not walking around with headphones on and so it's a lot harder to to implement this kind of this this connection in this undistracted undivided attention with what's going on at hand one easy way to avoid this is if you're having one of those one-on-one meetings is to close the door but i remember when i was a leader in the army for the first two three positions of leadership that i took my first roles i didn't have my own office so there wasn't really the capacity to do that so Sometimes you gotta get creative. Like, so when I was talking with somebody, even if it wasn't in an official capacity, like during a, a monthly performance review of of the work that they've done and their planning and their goal setting, if I wanted to have a little bit more of, a, of an intimate or connected conversation, I would have removed us from the situation, from the larger group. Sometimes it would be going outside, out back behind the building. You find a way, you know, take them for a drive. Like, all right, let's go grab a coffee and you go take a drive and you could talk on the way in the car, then you're closed off from all of those external noise um, distractions that are inevitably going to be coming up. And that's a way, what that does also when you're taking those active steps to make it more protected and more intimate, so to speak, and you're, you're showing the person that you truly value what it is that they're saying and you're interested in, in, in having that conversation and getting that feedback. Now, this is all fine and well, And you can take these steps to control those external noise stimuli that are coming in, those distractions. But there is another level within the noise that we, that I just mentioned a little bit ago called internal. So what's internal noise? Well, internal noise is all of those distractions that are happening inside of you. So it can be, you didn't get a great night's sleep and so you're not well rested and so your mind's not in the game. And people can tell when you're not fully present for whatever reason, they may not know the reason, but they know that you're not fully there. And that impacts that environment that you're setting up. So you get somebody and you pull them off to the side, but you're yawning three, four times while they're talking. It's not the best look. You know, there's typically a lot of grace given in these situations, but you want to avoid that when possible. And so you want to think about that going into these events. Like, am I present? Maybe you want to take a few moments, step, step aside, kind of 
center yourself, so to speak, or, you know, get yourself, you know, listen to that song that hypes you up, do whatever you need to do to get your head in the game. Some of the other things that can infect, that can impact this and that are other forms of internal noise are like hunger, you know, so maybe you don't plan that performance review at 11.30, you know, <laughs> if, if you're used to eating lunch um, and the other person's used to eating lunch, you don't want the stomach growls producing external noise to impact, but you, you definitely don't want the conversation to feel like it needs to be shortened because you guys are hungry and and it's impeding your ability to actually communicate. Other ones that people might not think about are kind of like the psychologically based internal noises. So think about a fight that you had with a significant other or these very large looming due dates for projects that you have coming up. If you have these things that are coming up, try to get yourself in a position, try to get ahead in your work, try to resolve a situation at work, or again, take that moment, step aside and and really focus, take a few moments to, to bring yourself in to be present, some mindfulness practices to be present in that moment so you're not letting those interfere. Because sometimes there's you're gonna have to have those meetings, you're gonna have to have those conversations when you do have impending you know deadlines when you weren't able to resolve that fight with your significant other before you left for work and they're going to be there being aware that those can impact it is the first step and then the second step is to actually take those few moments like we talked about and and put yourself as present make yourself as present in the moment as possible and that leads us to the next bit so now we've done all of this and we haven't even we haven't even really started talking yet, right? We haven't gotten there, but in in the previous episodes before now, we've talked a lot about the act of listening, effective listening, and, and the strategies to do that. You know, be quiet, listen twice as much as you speak. <laughs> That's the ratio maths, right? One mouth, two ears. Let's follow that. If you want more on that, go back a couple of episodes and go in this playlist, the communication series, the part of the Connected Leadership Project that we're working on right now, and check them out because there's a lot of good tips in there. But if you have and you're all good and spun up, let us proceed. This next piece is called semantic noise. It's the third and final part of the noise barriers. So semantic noise is really talking about the meaning behind words. And so and how we all have our own different interpretation of what words mean, of what phrases mean. And sometimes those can get lost in translation. I think one thing you think another thing about this and you might have the thought right now like what instance could that possibly have like how could this come up well let me give you an example on a podcast i did i was interviewing a good friend rob dubin and he has an incredible story you guys should really check it out um that that interview that we did it's on the channel in this conversation we discussed the importance of struggle and, and it's my contention that in order to have real meaningful growth in your life, it's important for you to have struggled, to have overcome things, to encounter difficult tasks, even if you have to put them in your own way, like working out, like cold plunges, like sauna, things like that. Like putting hard obstacles in your way that you have to overcome is training you both physically and mentally to understand that you know these obstacles come and you can overcome them and if you make certain workouts more difficult and the more and more difficult you make them the more you get trained on i can overcome difficult things and it just becomes part of your mentality and and your not just your belief system but it's what you're like your your no system like you know that you can do this you know you can overcome it because you've done it a bunch before that was my contention but the issue was rob did not agree he's like i don't think that you should have to struggle like and his whole premise his thought process is is bringing happiness into the workplace which coincides with what we do here very well he has his own i think he might have his own channel i know that he speaks and he's either gearing up or just completed a tedx talk so good on him pro style very proud of my good friend he believed in in challenge i believe is is what he liked he liked to believe in challenges and and stepping up to challenges and so we had this conversation it actually took us about 10 15 minutes in the podcast to get to the point where we understood that we were talking about the same thing we were just using different language to get there i with my military background i'm a little bit more direct and and 
I don't like to beat around the bush. And I, I think that struggle is important. And I think that you get struggled by implementing challenges. And so at any rate, we were both in agreement that that's, that's a road to growth, to more meaningful growth in a faster way than assessing just all the good times. It's good to have good times. It's good to understand how and why we were able to make those good times and those projects happen successfully. But the struggles are where we really grow when we take the time to actually step back and observe. It's important to pay attention to this in the conversation. And the way that you do that is actually, you know, pay attention to body language, pay attention to eye contact. And it's not to say that you have to read like three, four books on body language like I have back there. The point is to pay attention to changes. If they're making eye contact with you and they're engaged with the conversation and they're nodding and they're doing their own form of active listening while you're speaking, you also need to be listening while you speak. You need to be listening and observing those nonverbal cues because that will tell you when things start to shift. If you're paying attention from the beginning and you start to say something and their body language shifts and they make a slight facial gesture that makes you question how they're perceiving things. You know, you can't do that if you're not paying attention to them. So that's that's the way that we address these and to ask for clarity as we go along. Like, does that make sense? You know, I'll do that and um, and I'll try to make sure like I'm genuinely asking, like if this doesn't make sense, please let me know. So that way we can make sure we're on the same page. And typically that secondary action of like, no, I'm really I really want to know that will that will spur the conversation if that conversation needs to happen. All right, now we're going to talk about cultural barriers. But how does culture a barrier? I mean, what is culture? Culture is a set of expectations, you know, values, norms within a certain grouping or conglomeration of people. When culture becomes a barrier, it's when cultures come into contact with one another and when their norms and expectations of behavior are not simpatico or are not the same, there can be barriers in the communication, create some create some friction there. And so really from this point on for the rest of the episode, we're going to be looking at differences between ideologies, between perspectives. And we'll start here with the cultural perspective. And we're going to look at this from the cultural perspective in three different ways. We're going to look stylistically, like cultural styles, and we're going to be looking at both the formal and informal structures of the hierarchies and respect within a cultural space and even the decision-making process itself. And we're going to do this from a country level perspective, just for ease of conversation. We're going to, we're going to compare Japan with the United States. And now I'm very well aware that not all companies in Japan and not all companies in the United States operate the same as one another. This is uh, going to be generalized, but the point is to make it generalizable. And so you can just become aware of the types of things that you can be looking out for in your organization when you're working with people from different perspectives, from different places. Even, you know, if we're looking at businesses from the East Coast and the West Coast, there, there might be these differences. And if you're not aware of it, if you're not paying attention, then it might catch you off guard and can set you back. And so this is this is the point. So we're going to start with style. Stylistically, uh, between the United States and Japan, generally speaking, we see a direct versus an indirect kind of approach to communication. Now, in the U.S., we're very direct, right? The, our norms, our cultures, our expectations are to express openly and provide feedback and opinions in an honest and explicit manner. This can be seen, you know, when you're in a conference room and you're having a meeting and you're like, hey, I, you know, people all, that are invited to the meeting, theoretically, in a good working environment, are encouraged to voice their opinion. Otherwise, why would they be there? You know, so if you're in the if you're in that stage of of the conversation. So we take it on the flip side. We look at Japan and this is a much more indirect communication style in in the businesses in Japan and you know they typically rely more on nonverbal communication and an expectation of reading between the lines with a pretty heavy reliance on context being aware of you know that that gray space so to speak uh, but shifting and looking at these again US and Japan from a hierarchy and perspective uh, hierarchy and respect perspective we can see that in the U.S., you know, we used to be very hierarchy focused, very hierarchy based. Um, but over the last 10 or so years, we've seen a big shift in in organizations to flatten 
their company, to flatten the organization. And that is that has a, a direct impact on communication. And really the purpose of it happening was communication because what we would see and this is this is the case from the military what we would see in the, in the military is if we want a decision made and it re- some decisions require the authority of the commanding general of the unit and if you're at like a battalion or you're at a company you know or you're in a platoon you know, your, your ability to get your voice and your thought and your question or request up to that commanding general you have to go so let's take it from the battery so at a battery level a company commander or a company a company commander says you know i i I'm, I'm want to request authorization for the use of this equipment or whatever but it requires the commanding general well it's got to go it's got to go from the company up to the battalion the battalion command team and staff have to review it say yes okay we're going to send this up to the brigade okay the brigade gets it same exact thing brigade staff the respective staff for that request and the commander's got to say yep okay i approve that this request then it goes up because each one of these levels requires yes i approve of this request from this commander and i'm going to i'm i am putting my voice behind this and my position of authority behind this request to send this up. So they're basically like, I'm asking the question. They're, the commander becomes the representative asking. And so then from the brigade, then it goes up to the division. Then the division staff reviews it and then they send it to the general and he approves or disapproves. And that process can take quite a while. So the idea is and that was happening in organizations of the private sector too. So the idea was flatten, remove those layers. And so that way we can communicate more rapidly and we can shorten these the distance between idea and change or action in the organization. And so not even just the flattening, but another part of this part of kind of the respect um, perspective. A lot of people, when they hear respect, they think of respect towards their leaders, respect towards the senior folks around. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, the, the manner in which we communicate, this kind of goes back stylistically a little bit, is a little bit more direct, open, honest. Um, and that's what we respect both, you know, a good leader respects that from their people. They encourage that from their team members and from those within their charge. And, and that's what the, those people want, what the employees want as well. You know, they want that type of direct communication they want to be informed and and be kept in the loop but there's another you know kind of level of respect and that we can look at that as respect towards the organization and and that is represented frequently through like dress and appearance you know if if people are showing up and their hair is all messy and they're not dressed uh in somewhat professional fashion it shows a different level of respect for the organization itself for the mission and you know i I know there's a lot of people rolling their eyes right now i feel it i felt it inside (laughs) it's okay it depend. it does depend on your role it does depend on your your organization and your mission but that is that is the expectation that can be the norm depending on on your on your company and the whole point is that in the u.s it even in a lot of the high tech places you know, or in the tech side, I should say, that's, you'll see kind of more of that casual, uh, or like, I guess, casual business, you know, there's, if there's professional, there's business casual, and then, you know, casual, there's like a new layer that's, you know, casual business, it's just, just below business casual, but just above casual, or just casual, you know, hoodies and jeans or whatever, but the point is, that's not completely unheard of, inside of American organizations, especially nowadays. On the flip side, you have Japan as high levels of professionalism and dress and appearance and even the language and the, and the manner in which they're communicating with each other and uh, with the leadership. There's a lot of respect and deference given to those who are you know, older or in positions of seniority. And so that's if you don't know that when you're going into business and you show up to a meeting meeting with your American values and your American culture, or if you show up as Japan with your high degree professional culture, uh, you know, it, there's, and you're not aware of what to expect on the flip side, that's could make things a little bit complicated. You know? So, um, and, and you don't want to be caught off guard. And so it's interesting. One thing I just thought about is that a lot of this, 
uh, cultural awareness is kind of put on the United States because we are such a um, a diverse nation that we don't expect other people to and other countries to to bend you know their culture according to ours we will we will shift like i had a really good friend that i've mentioned uh on the show before and i've had on the show mario fox who completely changed you know what he was going to wear when he went to go meet with somebody i forget if they were from korea or japan i think it was from japan and red is like i believe is a power color and so he wore some or it's a color of high respect and so he had some subdued like he had a red uh, handkerchief, uh, pocket square, and he had like red socks, and he knew he was gonna have to take his shoes off when he entered, and so he had a red toned socks, and so the person noticed and even explicitly said, he's like, oh my gosh, it's so great, I love that you're wearing red, it means this, this is valuable, and Mario already knew that because he did his research ahead of time. It's not as likely that somebody from another country is going to come in and be like, what's the what's the standard here? And I mean. Because, I mean, part of it's like, what is the standard? I mean, if you, depending on it, it could just be suit and tie, which is relatively the same across everywhere you go. But uh, they're not going to be like, oh, I'm going to go meet with, you know, I don't know, the people at Meta or at Twitter. I'm like, okay, I'm going to show up at this time. Instead of wearing a suit, I'm going to wear a hoodie. Like, it's like, what is the, what is the culture? It's, it's, it's different. It's much more nuanced. And so we do find ourselves looking that way, but that's that's good like it's it's i think it's a beautiful thing for us to be in the position and us to have the respect and to take the time to understand that culture um and to figure out you know what matters to them and what is an efficient way to communicate and what's a respectful way to communicate to let them know that you know you're not some pompous american uh person that's going to try to dominate the the meeting and the relationship that you're you're aware you spent time looking into it and that means a lot and that can foster and strengthen those relationships looking in the decision making process you know the u.s oh, we tend to prefer open dialogues open discussions and debate you know long pauses are generally seen as uncomfortable in speaking patterns <laughs> so so it's it can come off or it may be perceived as a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding of weakness, of nervousness, you know, lack of experience, all of these things. And there is, or there can feel as though there's a, a, a higher degree of a chaotic nature when it comes to these conversations because of the emphasis on debate and making effective decisions as quickly as possible, getting to that answer and then going out and executing. It can feel forceful, and like I said, a little bit chaotic. And you know, when we flip the script and we take ourselves back to Japan in their meetings and in their decision-making process, there's a lot, there's a, a much higher degree of a relationship focused, you know, uh, energy. There's this desire to build consensus, you know, to seek harmony. Really, at the end of this, it's it's just important to understand who you're going to go communicate with, who is coming into your organization, who, what businesses are are you engaging with, and and do your homework. You know, get to know those who are going to get into business with you, and get to know those people even that you're hiring. You know, understand if they're coming from a different culture, if they're coming from a different place. Like, what is it? You know, what do they value? What are their expectations? What cultural norms and behaviors are they used to exhibiting in the workplace? All of these things are very important to assimilate people into your culture and to understand the culture of others that you are going to be collaborating with. Okay, let's shift and talk about gender. Don't worry, we're not going crazy. We're not going political. It's nothing like that. But there are gender barriers that you need to be aware of in the workplace that will help you to understand how and why other people are acting and so that you can take action to foster the relationships between yourself and others. And when we go through these, you're going to see like, oh, yeah, I know that. But it's it's just important to kind of call it out. And so that way we're we're able to recognize it more easily when it's happening and understand what our role is in a potential communication failure. So with men, men typically tend to interrupt far more frequently <laughs> in a conversation and are they're much more assertive and direct 
in their style of communication, right? We're talking about style before and cultural, same thing here, the much more direct in their style of communication. Um, and, and on that note, it might be because, you know, men have been in business for so long in the United States specifically that that's why the United States kind of style of communication is a little bit more assertive and indirect is because that's the way that men typically are. Like I said, far more willing to interrupt, far more willing to even self-promote you know, advocating for themselves and, and saying that, you know, I have a good idea or I'm really good for being in that position and fighting for themselves to get promoted or be put into these additional uh, positions of responsibility. And when it comes to conflict resolution, men tend to prefer to resolve their conflicts much more directly and, and perhaps even confrontationally to call somebody out live in real time. Whereas, you know, women use more cues uh, versus a kind of direct language approach, you know, especially in verbal, but especially in, in nonverbal communication, you know, women tend to focus on building rapport and, and listening actively. And if you've been a part of this project at all, and you've watched any of the previous videos, you'll know that that's what we promote here. We promote active, effective listening. And that's women, you know, generalized, tend to focus on that, tend to participate in active listening because they actually want to understand and they're not waiting for their turn to promote their ideas. And thus they're, they're far less likely to interrupt than men are, you know, and on that note, they're, they're far less likely to self-promote. They would rather see the best idea put forward um, that will actually solve the problem instead of just voting for their idea. Now notice the use of tend to frequently here. I, I, I bring these up, but I do believe that most people know this through personal real world experience, everything that we've been talking about. But everyone also has the experience of the opposite of this happening. You know, when, when you have worked with people of the opposite gender frequently enough, you will you'll end up seeing that there is no gold standard and there are many men who communicate in a much more subtle manner and who focus on building relationships and building rapport. I mean, I'm one of them. Look at this program. <laughs> the, whole, the whole premise of what we're doing is called connected leadership. That's my that's the leadership style and approach that I created and developed. And it's very much on the female side of this of this uh, spectrum of communication, if you will. And you have to bear in mind that there's also women out there who are much more direct than men and, and fierce in pushing themselves and their ideas through to the top. And I think that to a certain degree, not not so much in the the self-promotion side of things, but definitely in the direct style of communication, my wife is a great example of this. There's no way you're not going to know exactly what she's thinking or feeling. She's going to let you know when you're doing something that's messed up and there's not going to be a moment's hesitation which is a beautiful thing you know unfortunately what we've seen for the army now you can earmuff for for the children <laughs> that might be listening around but uh the problem that women tend to have at least this is what i experienced um, or what I observed women experiencing and from talking to them in the military this is what they they say they experience is you know if they're if they're focusing on relationship building on the way up then they get called a whore and if they get if they are looking out for themselves and direct and strict and you know by the book and hold people to the standard then they're a bitch right and unfortunately that that can be the case but i think it's just a matter of those typically those those reviews and those thoughts typically come from people in the combat arm side of the military which for those that aren't familiar there's a bunch of part of the army that is not combat arms right so combat arms are people be like the infantry and combat engineers and peace things like that um that are much more combat facing but there are a ton of other parts of the army that are different like supply lo logisticians intelligence uh even like the hr kind of management those are not combat arms and the reason why there's a difference there isn't because the combat arms guys are hard and the other ones are soft you know that's sure there's a degree of that to some certain extent but man, there's some there's some bad support people out there anyway the main difference is the frequency with which people work with the other gender. And so when, you know, 
I came up in combat arms. I was in short range air defense and I was actually in one of the last graduating classes that did not have females in the class. I think it was actually the class after us was the first class that they army had shifted their perspective on short range air defense to start allowing females into the positions. And so there was a couple of uh, girls or women young women who were going through the school in the classes uh following us and then some of those girls showed up to our unit later and they and they worked with us and so um you could see the shift especially with some of the guys that were more senior that there's a little bit of a harder time for them to to adjust and to understand the different types of communication styles and things of that nature because they've spent their careers only working around guys and an occasional uh, female here and there in those support roles because of that lack of familiarity then when you see actions that are taken that are that some people might not perceive as standard or regular or, or generalized from their other experiences with women in a professional capacity perhaps before or outside of the military um, they get caught off guard and they're like oh well obviously this is what you're doing and and it's naive it's it's all of the things that you could say about it it is that but it's just an exposure thing and as as more women came in especially from like the officer side and from the the kind of senior leadership perspective and not from the bottom up and more and more and more of that happens there's more exposure and people become more familiarized with that people come in different you know stripes and and with different perspectives and leadership styles and approaches and it's just about who's effective and so the the good leaders start to recognize that very quickly um and so that's that is part of the game unfortunately but but i think the important thing here is is get into the mode of kind of breaking this model of your of thinking in your head and really get to know your people individually i mean this is going to allow you to learn about your team in a real and enduring manner and that's, that's the only way. So if you get to know your people and how they operate and, and what drives them, what motivates them, what keeps them up at night, then you're going to understand why they're making those decisions. And as they progress and make their some, make themselves uh, more valuable to the team and put themselves in positions where they can get promoted and then they eventually get into the leadership positions, then you understand that. And that helps to promote more awareness and it helps to, you know, bridge the gaps of communication that are happening and so you're not assuming why people are doing something you understand it let's take a look at our next barrier again this is going to be another comparison another this versus that and how does this interplay and how do we bridge the gap and what we're going to be talking about is ethical barriers or moral barriers or you know values barriers to communication we're going to spend a lot of time actually talking about values in this section we're like organizational values versus personal values versus you know leadership values and and how these things all interplay so if we take for example organizational values let's just say an organizational value might be we place the customer first and we will not quit until we get it right, right? That sounds great. Like as a customer, I love to hear that. I definitely want to work with a company that's like that. That would be a strength. You're not going to quit until it's right, especially if you're in the industry where it's, you know, things are uh, curated. If you have curated products or services, like if I'm working with an organization and and I'm helping them to apply to understand the principles of connected leadership and and to implement them. You know, I I could just go in there like, here are the principles. Use them. Deuces. <laughs> or you can curate it. You can show and explain and give examples and, and then actually get to know the organization and the people that are involved and figure out how and where these principles can be specifically implemented within the different departments of that organization. It requires to be most effective, it requires that that kind of extra touch. And it would be great for that organization to hear from me that I'm not gonna quit until it's right. And we're not gonna quit until we get these, get your culture up, until people start to really appreciate the organization that they're a part of. And through building up a robust, a robust and resilient culture through strong leaders. That would be wonderful, right? That's exactly what you want. But here's the thing. If we translate this into the real world, what do, what do we see? We see I'm going to work super late into the evenings if I'm with my team. Uh, we're going to be working up. We're going to be staying up late during this project. We're going to be 
crashing on this brainstorming, uh, you know, and throwing things at the wall and seeing what we think fits for best for this organization, you know, each and every day until we hit that acceptable solution. And we have something that to present to them. We're go, we, we're going to be pulling super late nighters, you know? Um, now let's say one of my employees, one of my fellow uh, coaches is there and they have a personal value and it says, I'm a provider and I, part of my role as a provider is to take care of my family. So this can lead a person to working their tail off to ensure that they are secure in their workplace and in their position. They want to make sure that they're providing value to their teams and their cli- and their clients, you know, in a reliable and dependent dependable manner so that they're actually supporting the team. So this is this is good, right? This is exactly what you would want to see. But here's the thing. Everything's got its limits. So the conflict here comes into play with the sustained efforts over long periods of time, right? The impact that this role as a provider has on their family. Think about this over a long, like I said, over a long period of time, over an extended period. Let's say this person, you know, really digs in deep with me and and we're working and, and we're hustling and we get the solution. And then right around the corner, we're diving right into the next client that's gonna require the same thing. Then we're diving into the next client that's gonna require the same thing. And the next one, and the next one, and the next, and so on, because the client list is never ending. What does that do to that person, right? Well, I mean, they're a provider, right? And it's important for them to provide that type of financial support for their family. It goes a long way, you know, to be able to pay the bills, to cover insurance, to to put good food on their table. But it is just one of of many components of providing. You also have to consider, you know, the, the time, you know, each day to actually break bread and commune with their families. You know, this this also requires the necessary energy and motivation to show up when you're having dinner to be able to put yourself into it and to to have those conversations with your with your kids and your family about what's going on and not just show up and eat and be ex- be too exhausted to even talk. So even if they leave because like even if they leave work and they they physically leave work, right? At a reasonable time. If they're not bringing home the the mental and emotional energy and they're not able to be present with the family, then that's going to suffer and they're their role as a provider, their role as a leader in their family suffers as well. And this, I mean, inevitably, what is that going to lead to? It's going to lead to resentment. It's going to lead to the family resenting them. It's going to lead to them resenting me. And ultimately, it's going to lead to them quitting my team. You know, like if that's the expectation, they're, why would they stick around? They're going to go to somewhere else where they can get somewhat equal pay. Maybe they'll even take a pay cut if they can get more time back with their family. It's a real possibility. It's actually what's happening all over the place right now. So it's something to be aware of. You know, you have to know those values from your people and you have to know when they're in conflict, when they're in conflict and when they're not. So, but let's take a let's take another look at um, at another comparative analysis between values. So, leadership values versus personal values. So, leadership values can be the combination or the interpretation of organizational values, you know, with the leaders who enforce these to create the culture, and then, you know, how they either align or conflict with their teammates' values. That's really what we're looking at. So, each person, each leader, has their own perspective you know, has their own personal values. But when they're in a leadership position and when they're tied into the mission, they're they're taking those values from the organization, they're combining with their personal values, and then you kind of get that laid upon you as the worker. You know, and this is a scenario that can happen. It's not what every leader does, but it's this is what happens, or this is the perspective from a leader who is operating in a bubble. You know, they, they see themselves as an element that's outside of their teams versus a leader who's actually connected to them and understands that they are a part of, of the team and they're just looking at the state of affairs they're looking at the situation around them from a different perspective from their team you know with their head up and their eyes looking out to get a broader perspective on what's going on and so what happens here is you you you're not you're not connecting you don't understand the values and so how can you how can you bridge the gap how can you create that connection how can you create that bond and improve your culture if you don't know your team this all comes back to to communication doing your research understanding the people that you're bringing onto your team taking the time to get to know them showing up 
on the ground floor while they're working, while they're operating, seeing and experiencing and feeling the struggles that they're going through. And then, you know, those little chats, the five, 10 minutes before and after meetings, those taking them out to lunch, you know, learning, making sure that you understand the processes that they're doing. You know, if they just got a new script from the sales team that they're needing to pitch to go down there and you run through the script and call three, four people and see how it goes and, and begin to understand the type of struggle and what's going on for, for your team in that perspective. You know, what that that builds that connection as well. And it takes you out of that bubble and it puts you into the fight. And it builds that connection. People know that they can trust you, they can rely on you, and that you're actually there and you you desire to understand. You know, a leader coming in with a sense of curiosity is probably one of the, and a genuine desire to learn and know, it's probably one of the best things that you could do as a leader. If you genuinely want to know, then you genuinely want to know about your people. You want to know about the processes. You want to know about the customers and clients. And what? how do we bridge all of these communication gaps? Right. And so that's, that's the important part of understanding the differences between those personal and the leadership and the organizational values. Now let's take a look at technological barriers, right? This is the idea of, of looking at the different ways that we can communicate now, the different methods of communication and looking at the context for the content, right? So the so the difference between text versus email versus phone versus in person versus video chat you know the there's a lot of different ways to communicate with people and the question is how where what's the best what's the best way and i think it's very easy for people to say that obviously the best way is in person the best way to communicate hands down every single time is in person because you're not going to miss a beat you're not going to miscommunicate people are, are going to be able to read tone they're going to be able to read body language and all of these things that's true <laughs> i can't i can't argue with that but is all of that always required for every piece of communication is that how we get all of our information now and is that how we would prefer imagine waking up in the morning and you know, wanting to check the news, but the only way you can get the news is by having somebody physically show up to your house, knock on the door, you go out there and you and you talk face to face about what's going on in the world today. And they, you have the weatherman show up to your house and is talking to you about the weather for that day. Are those the best? Is that the best way? Do you need to have that for that type of information? You know, if I just want the weather, I don't even need a person talking. Give me a screen with a text and an image and show me the little cloud covering part of the sun. Show me the rain percentage for the day and I'm good, you know? So it's it's not always the best to be in person. It's all contextual. It all matters on what's going on. Look at emails. Emails are a really good tool for internal use to one another um, for one perspective and and provide a really great ability for us to list out a series of steps or you know a long piece of information that may need to be referenced multiple times i mean this also comes into perspective where an email can include a link to a share drive you know where that has that document and it can be a, a quick let them know but on the quick let them know part of it texts are really good too they're really good for quick or short-term notices you know generally of a lesser priority than than emails depending on the culture and organization some people use uh team chats like slack or things like that teams to be able to communicate quickly but typically with those you're still not relaying the priority information that might just be like hey check out this email i just sent you it's about this client blah 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 um, or we need to hop on the phone so we can talk more about this. But it could also be things that aren't necessarily totally work related. Like, hey, last minute, I want to take you guys out for lunch. Come meet me in the parking lot and we'll talk about where we want to go or shoot shoot ideas of places that you would like to go into the chat. You know, that's 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 an effective way and a good use of, of text or chat services like that. So in person is definitely best for things like performance reviews or an exchange of information that kind of requires your full and undivided attention where you can like we talked about in the beginning, you could control, you have more control over those barriers to communication, the sound, the noise, uh, the internal, the external, the timing and all of that, you know, but just behind that, you know, that's really good. And if you can have those in-person meetings where you're able to get the body language, the feel for everyone where you know there's not, you know, a dog down here by my feet that's distracting me because he's nibbling on my toes. You don't have that <laughs> in the office, you have that undivided attention. But video is 
a, a really solid second for those and perhaps even a first for others like and we talked about like the weather, you know, I cool. I could watch the guy in the news. Whenever you're watching the news, that's essentially like a video conference where you're just receiving the information though. But video is also great for those initial meetings with people outside of the organization because it's far less logistically demanding and, and arduous than try to schedule an in-person meeting, you know, for, for those initial client calls, for you have a discovery call with a new client. That's a great tool to be able to use because you get that connection. You get to see, like you're seeing me right now, you get to see me, you get to hear me and you get to like understand my body language and my movement and my tone and all of these things in a very similar degree, but you're not asking so much of the other person, especially if you are asking them eventually to become a client, let's work a little bit on their schedule and their calendar first. But like I said, you still get to see each other's face and your body language and all of that, all of those nonverbal cues and even the dress, you know, the artifacts that we wear to communicate as well. So now I have a question for you guys. Do you want to see some holes shot in my arguments? You want to see see me get put into my place? You think that I'm I'm talking all this and and I'm I'm speaking from a vacuum, I'm operating from a bubble. So do you want to see a little bit of opposition? You want to see where my ideas fall short? and have me get pushed on some of my practices right here on the show. All right, it, it might not be all that, but we do have a surprise addition to this series, this communication series, where I'm gonna bring on a special guest to go through communication in the workplace, really to ensure at the bare minimum that we don't leave any key essential out. You always learn so much more by communicating and spending time and, and discussing ideas with other people. So while these ideas have been developed over a long period of time and tested and tried it, I, I always like to put myself in a position where I can learn more. So check that out in the next episode. I'll see you guys over there.